the fraction of industries that are likely to be affected in the short run, or jobs affected by the in the short run, by artificial intelligence is is relatively small, uh, particularly in India, you know, in, in less developed countries, um, in emerging markets. Uh, but over the long run, the idea that machines can do uh, many of the jobs that humans can do, um, and replacing humans re represents uh, uh, an important question. Um, there is the possibility that machines, rather than replacing humans, actually augment humans, that machines can make humans more effective, and in which case that's the normal kind of uh, productivity enhancing that we've often seen. But uh, it is potentially the case that uh, art AI, artificial intelligence, will uh, represent uh, worker replacing. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the effect of that will be that it is uh, conceivable that uh, there will be significant distributive effects of technological change. Um, and uh, whether those whether those kinds of technology changes are overall welfare enhancing will depend on society's uh, policies for managing both the redistributions and most importantly for my mind uh, job creation so I think that at least for a developed country like the United States UBI is not uh, a good idea because uh, at least for my generation uh, work is associated with dignity and human dignity. I, I think the responsibility of government is to create jobs and um, it can do that because there are huge numbers of jobs in uh, in an emerging economy uh, necessary to build infrastructure, technology, education, caring for the aged, health, uh, which will not be replaced anytime soon. So the uh, point, one of the important points I make in our paper with Anton Kornak is that the nature of the technological change is that it creates rents which can be taxed. So if there is the political will, we can generate revenues that will ensure that everybody's better off. So this is a largely a political issue. Now, if your democracy doesn't work well, and America is an example of a dysfunctional democracy, but if you have a democracy that works well, then you will have a tax system that can uh, ensure that everybody or almost everybody can benefit from uh, these kinds of uh, technological progress. But if you don't do that, you're going to wind up with a society in which the losers will become an important uh, resistance to uh, further progress. One part of the uh, question you asked about globalization and, and uh, globalization, is, you can think of as a technological advance that, that it's a chain, the ability to bring countries together. Uh, the uh, question, you know, uh, uh, globalization is being questioned now by the United States. That to me is the greatest threat to globalization because Trump has attacked the uh, international treaties and the international organization and the rules-based system. So, in my mind, uh, while I've been a great critic of globalization, it's because I thought the rules were unfair to developing countries, not that they were unfair to the United States, but in some ways they were unfair to American workers. So they were written really ba based for corporations for their advantage relative to the workers in both the developed and developing countries. Uh, 
which is one of the important points I try to make in my new book, uh, Globalization and its Discontents Revisited. Um, but the response, if the United States is going to uh, effectively withdraw from institutions like the WTO, uh, and I say effectively because it's undermining right now the, the appellate system by vetoing the uh, appointment of new judges, which uh, there are two vacancies and there, next year there'll be a third, and that will uh, uh, undermine the ability of the WTO to engage in the adjudication process. Um, it's not a, a good solution, but it's the only solution that's possible, is the rest of the world will have to say, uh, just like a rule of law within a country is important, you need an international rule of law, and that's what the WTO is, and if you don't like it, you work to reform it. But what they will have to do is to say, even though in the past they've been a consensus-based organization, they have to say, we can't let one country destroy us. And therefore, the rest of the world, I think, has to go ahead, including India and China, and say, we will make this international regime work for the rest of us, and we will figure out what happens with the United States, but we will have judges. If you decide you don't want to abide by the results of that, you bear the consequences because you signed the WTO treaty. You haven't, you know, you haven't withdrawn from it, and the U.S. will not withdraw from it. Uh, so I think that the rest of the world really needs to to uh, increase the resolve not to let Trump get away with what he's trying to do is undermine the uh, international order. On the issue of investment, uh, one of the important areas is public investment, and uh, I think it's one of the things that uh, has held. Uh, India back the, the infrastructure and uh, it, it's difficult to export goods particularly if, if you don't have good infrastructure. Um, that is going to need uh, probably higher taxation and uh, uh, more public expenditure because these are basically within the public sphere and the cost of uh, the, the, you might say, yeah, the, the a well-organized government program can do it much more efficiently than the tradition, you know, public-private partnerships, which are shown to be very inefficient in carrying these things out. Um, the uh, having a good financial system is also very important for investment, uh, and uh, systems of bail-in uh, really undermine. Uh, confidence in the financial system. Uh, in, you want the financialization of the economy. Ordinary individuals can't inspect the books of every bank. Uh, they have to rely on government to see whether the bank is sound. That's one of the important regulatory functions of government. And uh, they have to have assurance that uh, uh, the money is safe. And to tell them that, uh, oh, by the way, your money isn't safe, if it collapses, you have to uh, get a haircut, as they call it, uh, you lose uh, your money, will mean that people will not trust the financial system. And uh, what you really want is the economy to be moving over time increasingly to an electronic system. It's a much more efficient system than using paper money or having people bury money in their mattress. So uh, that's what happens when you move to a financial system now. You can use debit cards and, and this will undermine all, all of that. So um, the answer is not a bail-in. The answer is twofold. One, make sure the banks are adequately capitalized with equity and make sure they're adequately supervised and regulated. In general, uh, one needs to have adequately capitalized banks and that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the capitalization is important.
important, uh, particularly in the private sector, because it ensures that they have the incentive to behave well because they have their skin in the game. I mean, otherwise they have too much of an incentive to lend money to friends and then uh, when it bails out, it goes bad, the government has to bail it out. So you have to have enough money for the right incentives and also to protect uh, the public. And that's particularly important for the private, for the private banks. The very negative effects of demonetization, which was done very poorly and, and I think from an economic point of view, not a well thought out uh, economic initiative and particularly the point that he made that it affected the part of the economy that's not measured very well, which is the informal sector, which is a very big part uh, of the Indian economy and, and those effects are likely to, to have legs, uh, that is to say, to persist so for a while. Um, the problem with aggregate consumption, uh, in general, for uh, you know, this goes back to, to uh, we were saying is there's a need for the economy to have more investment. For an economy at the stage, uh, you know, what, what made the East Asia countries so successful is they have very uh, high savings rates. And uh, 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 the, so in some sense, I don't worry about too low of consumption. What I worry about is that the savings are not being translated into productive, uh, 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 the productive investment. So you want a high level of aggregate demand and that takes uh, my aggregate uh, policies, um, for instance, to tax high profits, high incomes, and that are not being reinvested in the economy. I think that uh, uh, Partly is to make a more competitive economy, because one of the barriers to investment, at least in many of the countries I know in the United States, is that we've gotten in many sectors of our economy a high degree of monopoly power. So there are high profits but low incentive to invest because uh, they don't want to compete against themselves. So um, making the economy more competitive and uh, is probably one of the most uh, important. And I also think you could always use tax policy. That is to say, you say to a firm, to, to especially the large corporations, which do have these market power and monopoly profits, that if you invest your profits in the country and create jobs, you will get a tax credit. You will have your taxes reduced in effect. But if you don't, we will tax those profits at a high rate. So I think that you can create incentive structures that encourage more private investment.